today um, is the second last sessions of the hub um, in this academic year. And uh, so we are very happy to have um, colleagues from different centers gathered together here. And um, we will have 10 presentations from uh, five colleagues, um, colleagues from five centers. There are 14 presenters. So really grateful for um, their sharing. And uh, there will be really a lot to, um, to hear about, about our experiences and reflection uh, over the last year. So we have had three semesters and more of uh, online teaching and learning. Um, in, in the last two years. So um, what we will be hearing today, I think we will get some insight on um, redefining assessment, uh, what is a classroom and uh, materials development and course design and also um, assessment. So we will have three different sessions Let's, let me uh, share the program here. Lucas will put the link in the chat room. Okay, so um, um, assessment. So we have uh, three presentations. Each will be eight minutes, and then we will have a discussion time. Um, and then we'll move on to student engagement. So engagement is also a big topic, um, especially for online teaching and learning. So uh, let's hear from these colleagues. And then uh, after that, we'll have a break. And um, the last part, uh, we will talk about the use of technology and uh, materials design and curriculum uh, uh, development. So, um, but it doesn't mean that they are all, you know, in the, um, uh, separate uh, sessions. They are all actually integrated. So you will hear the use of technologies in other sessions too, for example, and student engagement in throughout all these presentations. So at the end, uh, we should have around, um, hopefully half an hour, 20 minutes to half an hour uh, for overall discussion. This is where um, we will try to have a breakout room depending on the time. All right, for us to really, you know, get together to share our experiences. So um, I would like us to put our university next to our names. So please do so if you haven't done that, because that will be uh, helpful for Lucas to put us into groups so that we will be talking with colleagues from different centers. So today, apart from me, we have Adam and Branch uh, here as facilitators. So let us get started. All right. So we will be very strict on time. Um, so Lucas will um, ring a bell. Lucas, are you going to show us that sound? Yeah. Okay. Silent bell. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. <laughs> okay, that's great. Okay, when we have 20 seconds left, for a presentation, okay? So uh, please really try to keep your time to eight minutes. So let's get started. Um, I'll hand over the time to Adam. Okay, yeah, and so we're gonna start with assessments. Assessments, we had lots of challenges in the last two years to move them all online. We're gonna hear people uh, from back to few and Polly you about um, how they've coped with moving assessments online. So first, let's go to Paul Myers, back to few. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen just a second. Okay, um, um, welcome and thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Paul Myers. I'm from Hong Kong Baptist University. And I really wanted to share my experiences moving an online listening test, uh, or moving a test that's normally paper-based to um, an online mode, which uh, gave me a lot of consternation over the past uh, 500 days or so. Uh, we've been doing it for three semesters. Uh, the course title is Comprehension of Modern Spoken English Culture and Context, which is a high-level listening course. 
a lot of students who join this course are English majors or uh, they have high uh, levels of English proficiency. Um, they are highly motivated. They're very interested in a lot of the, the uh, clips and videos that we share with them. And the course was, was designed originally to uh, work on motivation for the students uh, and to give them the chance to become more independent in their language learning and listening uh, skills. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot to it. I know the, the title is, a, is slightly vague. I think it it's based on advanced English listening. That was uh, the, the original title of the course. And then it got upgraded and more elements got added to it. Um, the normal test administration. So we did have tests for this course in the original version. Uh, the test was in the classroom. Right. So so then, you know, you can you can really uh, see that that it would be uh, have a high level of security um, adhering to the exam regulations of the university. And, you know, we could give them the paper. It was paper based. We give them the paper based test and then we could collect it back from them at the end. So so I would say like that was the best way to do it. And then when everything got moved, um, online uh, about a year ago with which was that second semester the uh, semester b 20 uh, academic year 2019 2020 uh, the first idea that we had because we were we were kind of in like the uh, survival mode we moved the test onto Moodle so we placed the test on Moodle and then um, the test paper was there. Students needed to submit the test before the deadline and rules were given to them. You can see here, I put a little, a little picture here of the test. Okay. So that, that was the, the test. And, uh, that was our first idea because we thought like the students could still, um, at, at least do something rather than just canceling the whole course. Uh, you can see here that we had uh, a lot of rules. I, I mean, that we, hopefully the students read, um, uh, one of the rules says, please only listen to each clip only once or you're going to run out of time. But we had, I mean, to be honest, we had no idea exactly how much time we should be giving the students. So that was kind of arbitrary. Then we did have a time limit. So the students listened to the clips or the videos that we gave them on Moodle. They completed the Microsoft Word document. Then they needed to upload here. And you can see here, they uploaded it to Moodle, then, then that was done. Um, and if they uploaded it late, there was, a, there was a minor deduction. So we did try to make it as strict as possible. However, there was a lot of security issues with this that um, you know, caused me to lose sleep at night uh, because you know, once, once we put the test online, all everything was out to the students. Um, students could probably listen multiple times. They could still Google for answers. They could, you know, there's no way to monitor them. There's no way to interact. And it was dissimilar from the real, the real listening interactions that we wanted to test them on. Uh, so the second iteration of the online listening test was that um, I wanted to use H HKBU Qualtrics, which is an online surveying platform. Um, and I wanted to read the, the blurb to you that, that comes with the company, the company Qualtrics, I'm sure uh, that you, you maybe have had experience working with them before. It says Qualtrics makes it easy to collect feedback from customers, employers, employees, suppliers, partners, and other stakeholders using channels they prefer, using advanced text and voice analytics. Qualtrics automatically surfaces hidden insights buried deep in the customer feedback. Okay, I did not go that far with it, but I thought it was a pretty uh, user-friendly platform. So when I did go through and try to use it, I found out that I could give the students the test um, using this survey platform and play the audio video through Zoom. Uh, and then it was a lot easier for me to interact with the students via microphone and Zoom uh, chat, um, you know, the video cameras. Uh, oh, originally I thought they could be turned on, but then due to bandwidth limitations for some of the students, we had to turn them off. So here's another security issue. Um, and then I, I, I just, there was a lot of, there was a lot of work to get the test ready because I had to prepare them on Google docs and then transfer. So that was an extra thing I had to do. And then it kind of looked like this. Let me just show you a few 
things. So it was easy for me to get their names and their email address and everything would be recorded. And here, here's the rules again, right? So I gave them like lots of rules. Uh, and then Qualtrics has a way where you can actually have them sign. So then I could check to see if it was their signature. Okay, like, like the idea was to get it a little bit more secure. And then we had the text questions. Um, now this is just a sample, right? Uh, but this is forms. So you can put a form and then you can have lots of questions here. So I took time, it took me some time to figure out how to do this. But once I figured it out, now I can make, you know, I can transfer everything very quickly. Uh, and here's some examples of the answers. So I, like I said, I played it online, they answered. Okay. So I, that, that's, that was the idea and I could control it. At the very end of the test, you could see where they are. Right. So this is the, uh, this is Qualtrics uh, platform. So I think it says here that they're in Shenzhen. So I don't know. I don't know how accurate that is. Uh, oh, then I could close the survey. So once the survey was closed, the students had no longer had any access to it. It's closed. And um, and, and so then we could go to um, to market. Uh, the security issues might be that. Um, you know, students can still take screenshots. They can talk with their friends, perhaps. I mean, because we didn't have the cameras on, they might be able to get help from Google. And I mean, who knows? I, I mean, this list isn't exhaustive. They, uh, exhaustive. They, they could, you know, record the audio and replay it as the test was, was, was taking place. Um, and then, yeah. So oh, let me just show you the marking very quickly. So then I could generate all of the data on Qualtrics and it was quite convenient for marking. So these are all of the students. So each row is a student. And then I could just add in another row and put the score underneath. Okay. This is kind of rudimentary, but it would add up uh, to, to the correct score at the end. Um, you just had to figure out how to use Google sheets and uh, do the summing. Uh, so that was the marking. And then some of the test questions I had, I mean, one other thing that I did was I tried to make it so that students could do um, like a, a multiple choice and then write something in and then do a multiple choice to try to make it easier if they couldn't type. So that was another consideration. So I amended some of the questions. Um, final thoughts are that, you know, the test was, was some students said, are, are, they, thought, they, they thought it was easy, some thought it was extremely difficult, um, and it gave them a lot of panic when they took the test, they told me, and some students, if they can't type quickly, may have been at a disadvantage, and perhaps some of the sound being played over Zoom might not be perfect, and some internet connections are not fast enough, perhaps, um, especially if a VPN is turned on. But I, I didn't hear that complaint too often. And a lot of a lot of things, you know, like I said, gave me consternation. Um, even though I try to improve the security, a lot of things are uh, it's it's not foolproof, is what I'll, is what I'm saying. Um, new tests would need to be created because they've already been distributed to the students. So I kind of like the online test due to the fact that I'm not stuck in front of the copy machine uh, and, I, and I don't need to waste all the paper, but students seem to see like pr prefer paper-based and perhaps, you know, rather than just using these tests, we might use presentations uh, as, as an additional assessment. Okay, uh, that's all for me. Oh, here's my email address in case you would like to send me an email to, uh, to give me some, some of your uh, viewpoints on how to better administer the tests. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. Yeah, very interesting. And we'll have time for questions at the end of this session, but we wanna go on. And so next is Eric, Eric Ho from PolyU, and you're gonna be talking about a literature course and how you did assessments there. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Adam. Um, let me share my screen. All right, so um, the topic is adopting the curriculum integrated approach into an English literature course. And um, this approach focuses on the learning processes through which students can do better in their assessment tasks. And you know, in the past two years, because of the pandemic, we started using, um, you know, different um, conf uh, video conferencing platforms to conduct teaching and learning. 
and uh, for example, like through Microsoft Teams or uh, Pepper Collaborate Ultra and Adobe Connect, I guess you may have used different platforms in the past two years. And they are web conferencing applications incorporating a range of functions, just chats, um, audio, video interaction, and interactive whiteboards. Although there were similar uses of synchronized online teaching using uh, video conferencing applications in school setting before the pandemic, um, video conferencing had not been so common, like a, a common practice uh, in Hong Kong ESL classroom. That's why two years ago when we were revising the curriculum for online teaching and learning, we also wanted to take this opportunity to get students more responsible for their learning process, including assessment tasks. We also consider how uh, we could replace the rich face-to-face -face interaction in formal classrooms with both synchronized and asynchronized activities. We then look at different models and finally have adopted Professor uh, Pichano blending with pedagogical purpose model. That's uh, the model you can see on the screen. His model is an integrative model which um, emphasizes the integration of pedagogy and technology in course design. The model also suggests that blending the objectives, activities and approaches within uh, multiple modalities might be most effective for an appeal to a wide range of students. The uh, model contains six basic pedagogical goals and approaches for achieving them to form learning modules. The model is flexible and very important, flexible, and assumes that other modules can be added as needed and where appropriate. So first of all, I'm going to uh, talk about the content. Content is one of the primary drivers for, of instruction. Uh, while much of what is taught is delivered linguistically, this, is, uh, this does not have to be the case. Um, learning is greatly enhanced by visualization. Language learning can be are uh, greatly enhanced by rich digital images. Learning management platforms like Blackboard that we are using at PolyU can provide basic content delivery mechanism for blended learning and easily handle the delivery of a variety of media, including text, video, and audio. In providing and presenting content, the blending with pedagogical purpose model suggests that multiple technologies and media be applied. So you can see that um, in the past two years, instead of asking students to you know, read a short story in a literature course, we also include a um, audio book on uh, Blackboard. And in another uh, literature course, we also include some discussion uh, regarding feminism, instead of asking students to read academic uh, articles about feminism. And then the second component is uh, the uh, social emotional aspects. Um, this social and emotional development must be acknowledged as important to education at all levels. Teachers who have taught um, graduate courses would know that, you know, emotional connection with students will be very important. They have a lot of questions and during the pandemic, students may feel that they got less opportunities to ask questions. They may feel shy speaking up in front of their camera or you know, they just don't want to speak uh, while attending the lesson at home or in a classroom somewhere. So um, help uh, connecting with students emotionally can help us understand and uh, you know, students learning progress. And also uh, we can provide um, more advice to students regarding different assessment tasks. For example, they may not know how to prepare for the assessment. This is um, quite important if you are teaching year one students, you know, they come from DSE curriculum, they were passive in secondary education and in university, we expect them to be more proactive. And this emotional connection is very, very useful. And in our course, we provide, we include a consultation in the curriculum. Uh, the course coordinator has also um, uh, kindly provided extra consultation session for students. And then number three, dialectic and questioning is an important activity that allows teachers to analyze what students know and to help refine their knowledge. Um, for dialectic and questioning activities, electronic discussion board or forum is effective. Like, you know, we just use our Microsoft OneDrive 
and we have students respond to questions and provide, and we ask them to provide their own perspectives while evaluating and responding to the opinions of others as well. The simple practice also allows students to see how the entire discussion or lesson has evolved. And, you know, we ask them to upload different uh, responses onto the Microsoft OneDrive. And these are all written web codes for students to, you know, um, review the lesson if they want to. They will also see how much they have learned since week one or since the beginning of that uh, unit. And then number four, reflection can also can be incorporated as a powerful pedagogical strategy under the right circumstances. Um, while reflection can be a deeply personal activity, the ability to share one's reflections with others can be beneficial. Uh, pedagogical activities that require students to reflect on what they learn and to share their reflections with their teachers and fellow uh, classmates extend and enrich reflection. Uh, we ask students to write a uh, peer evaluation report in order to show us what they had learned during the peer review activities. Um, we also ask them to think about what and how they can improve their performance before the actual assessment task. And then we also encourage collaborative learning, even though uh, the learning was conducted online. In face-to-face -face classes, group work grew in popularity and became commonplace in many course activities. Many programs, including education, uh, rely heavily on collaborative learning as a technique for group problem solving. In the past, the logistic and time needed for effective collaboration in face-to-face -face classes were sometimes problematic. And now, technology and other forms of electronic communication can you know, tackle the logistical issues. Um, we have made peer review a compulsory activity for each assessment so that students can learn from each other and enhance their self-reflection for improvement. So um, they won't feel uh, lonely when doing the assessment. They, they can still get support from their classmates. And the last component is evaluation. Evaluation of learning is perhaps the most important component of uh, the model. Learning management platforms provide a number of mechanisms to assist in this area. Uh, papers, test assignments, and portfolios are among the major methods used for student learning assessment and are easily done electronically. The portfolio is evolving and, uh, into an electronic multimedia presentation of images, video, and audio. The teacher can review the records over and over again to see how students have participated and you know, improved over time. Uh, they are also uh, most helpful to us as teachers to assess their own, uh, our own teaching and review what worked and what did not work uh, during the pandemic. Uh, very important um, that um, uh, we evaluate student work before the actual assessment. They were quite lost. Um, without any inputs from us before the assessment, I mean, extra inputs. Okay, so um, that's what uh, we have done um, so far during the pandemic. And we certainly believe that there's something that we can continue doing after the pandemic. So that's all for me, Ed, over to you. Thank you, Eric, thank you very much. Um, and we got one more uh, presentation on um, assessments uh, from Jessica Shah. Again, Polly you. Hi Jessica. everyone, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, okay. Uh, just want to start presenting. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, okay. So eight minutes starts now, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, today I'd like to talk to you about lessons I've learned from just moving presentations online. Um, focusing more on asynchronous presentations, video submissions. So when we talk about the possibility of going back into the classroom, I think a lot of colleagues are really excited about being able to see their students present live again. Like we all see the value, we all understand the value of a live presentation. But then a lot of times I, I hear colleagues saying that video presentations work really well. Um, no matter if they're synchronous or asynchronous, a lot of them want to be able to keep that element. So what's the biggest challenge um, that I have to encounter? I think no matter if we're doing live or recorded presentations, interaction is the biggest issue. Um, specifically, when I think about the Q&A session, it's always so awkward, especially in an online setting. It's just so awkward having students come up with questions to ask each other. Like a lot of people are using the chat. They're just 
popping their questions there and people addressing questions there. A lot of people are on mute. So even though, you know, they have something to share, uh, the interaction element online, or even like sometimes in a face-to-face -face classroom where they're doing a presentation, like the question and answer, the interaction is always a little bit awkward. And so I'd like to share with you uh, two things that really worked for me online and really were able to encourage students to ask meaningful questions, to give each other feedback and to really help them through this process. So uh, I used OneDrive a lot uh, and it's just so much more than just storage or email. Uh, so this is an example uh, of a peer review arrangement. So uh, as you can see, uh, this is in week eight in the middle of the semester. So uh, I'll just show you here. So it's a three hour session. So the first hour, I gave them one hour to record their practice presentation and then 15 minutes to review just one other video. So during the time when they review the other video, they have to come up with some really simple, clear points to give as feedback and then prepare just one question for a live Q&A session. So then you can see that I've divided uh, 16 students into three groups. So they'll come for a live Q&A session. And I'll just uh, use the first group, Phoenix, Helen, Jay, Jen, and Meg uh, as an example. So then on uh, OneDrive, you can see this is the peer review folder. And you can see, so uh, two groups, they've uploaded their practice presentation in the first hour. And then you see five files here where uh, the five individuals then comment and give feedback to the other group. So if you click on one of these files, it looks like this. I give them some questions, some prompts, and then uh, they give each other feedback. So this is an example from Jay, Jay commenting on Helen and also Phoenix. So I just want to show you some uh, an example of the feedback that they give each other. Really simple ones, like more questions, photos in the beginning, please. Um, you haven't really stated why you chose the topic. Please include a clear thesis statement, and you're talking too fast. I know I'm talking too fast right now, but there's an eight limit, eight minute limit, sorry. You're talking too fast, can you please slow it down? So just really simple things like that could really help students prepare for their actual presentation later on. The reason why I like video submissions and I plan to still do them, even if we go back to face-to-face -face, is because of the time. Students actually have time to record it. They have time to review another video. They have time to think about meaningful questions and feedback to ask. During the live Q&A sessions, I get really good questions really. Uh, and another thing that I love about it is real time. Different groups are doing it at the same time. So you're not spending extra class time. You're not waiting for numerous presentations to happen and then everybody giving each other comments and feedback. They're doing it at the same time and it really saves a lot of time. So um, that's why I actually use it for uh, the actual uh, assessment as well. Uh, at the end of the semester, I really don't like it when students just submit a video as a final assessment and then, you know, goodbye. There's no feedback. There's no interaction. You know, you don't get a proper goodbye when you're in an online setting. So um, the deadline is 48 hours before the final class. And then you see here, uh, the requirement is just watch your peers video. I put them in eight groups, each have a session, review each other's video, come up with at least one question to ask each other. Now, the feedback that I got is students actually appreciate the fact that their peers actually watch their videos. You know, in a in a face-to-face -face setting, a lot of students are not actually listening, right? In an online setting, a lot of students are not even there, maybe. So what I'm trying to say is when you're putting them into these live Q&A sessions, they're watching each other's videos and actually students appreciate that element. So um, this is a quote from, uh, by Professor Chu from the Northern Arizona University. He's saying that technology, we should move away from using technology as presentation or just storage. It should be used as an interactive tool. And something as simple as OneDrive could really allow us to encourage interaction and you know, giving meaningful feedback, asking meaningful questions, responding to questions. But then moving from you know, uh, face to face presentations to video submissions, I think one misconception that students have is they have to be digital savvy, they have to be able to have good, great editing skills like video editing skills. Um, I'd like to use one example of how we're directing students to focus more on we're still assessing presentation skills, it's still about communication skills. So this is a two credit course, it's a discipline with specific requirement, and a little bit of background uh, is it, the whole premise is there's half a million dollars up for grabs and we call it the ELC fund. And we want students to really be themselves. 
no fake CV, no fake experience to see themselves, uh, draw on their own experience and interest for the entire course. So that is why the first assessment is really for them to introduce themselves, uh, giving them the opportunity to really evaluate their own experience, their interest, what kind of topics are they interested in. So uh, the first assessment is an individual portfolio, video portfolio. It's like a self-introduction. But uh, week one and two, we focus on storytelling skills, message, structure, delivery. We have authentic samples for them to evaluate. They record a one minute, 30 second video. They have to give feedback to each other. Uh, weeks two and three, we focus on language features and how audio visual elements should not overpower the message, but enhance the message. Again, we have authentic samples. They give out storyboards and give each other feedback. And then week four, they submit a one minute, 30 second self-introduction video. And they could review how the final submission is so much different than the one that they did in week one. So the focus really is not about their editing skills. It really is about digital literacy, how they're using technology to achieve their objectives, uh, audience awareness, how they're showing what they want to say and not directly telling you through a, a well-structured storyline, storytelling skills, persuasion of the audience. You would want to you know, get to know them more, or if you're an interviewer, you want to call them for a follow-up interview. Uh, clarity, understanding key points, how they're enhanced by audiovisual elements and not overshadowed by them, not over-editing. We're not ask asking them to become professional video producers or something like that. So um, no matter if we're still online or we're going back to face-to-face, -to -face, uh, video submissions, asynchronous presentations, I see a value in that. Uh, it, it really frees up class time for feedback and interaction. And I do believe that students can develop transferable skills through these types of assessments. So that's all I have prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, perfect timing as well. Um, so now we have time for a discussion. If you've got questions for either Paul, Eric, or Jessica, or any other comments about um, assess assessments, um, how you've moved them online, here's your opportunity now. Please don't be like my students and just be quiet. Can I ask Jessica a question? Could I hi, ask Jessica? Kira. Hey, Jessica, hi. I really liked your presentation. Can I just ask you, so when your students are presenting and you're asking another group to watch them, um, do you have a certain thing they need to fill out? Like they need to ask one question or how do you get them to engage while they're watching? So if it's the peer review, so I actually give them class time to do it because I don't want them to feel like it's extra work. So okay. for the peer review, the practice, I give them one hour of class time to record the presentation. And then I give them time to just watch one other video. And then the rest of class time, they come back in groups and do the live question and answer. So to oh. answer your question, yeah, yeah. So that's what I do. So to answer your question, when they're watching each other's video, I give them a form with prompts with certain questions, uh, only two focus areas. And uh, they basically, they just have to complete the form. So then that would already be feedback. But then when they actually join the session, the final part of the session, they're asking each other questions. Uh, that's yeah, that's a great idea happens. to make the final part live, right? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's great. So even if we're going back to face-to-face, -to -face, I'm going to be, I, I personally would still want the peer reviewer, the practice to be online and to still use this video submission way because then we could free up a lot more time for students to actually interact awesome thank you so much great ideas great thank very you. inspiring thanks thank jessica you, Kira. any more questions paul i have a question for you about um uh, be, be listening test. So th did you have any automatic marking or did you have to do it all by yourself? Uh, uh, Qualtrics does. You could set it up to do automatic, actually. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't go that far mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, in reviewing Qualtrics. I mean, I did watch a few tutorials. I made it about as far as a basic beginner just in order just to get this test out there but they do have, it is, it's a very, very powerful platform and it's user-friendly. Uh, I mean, I'm not advertising for them, but uh, I, think, I think all of the universities probably should have it. Is, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think and 
they recently did an upgrade to make it even a little bit more user friendly. Uh, I think just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, you know, if you contrast that with Moodle, I didn't find Moodle to be so easy to develop some kind of, on, I mean, even a, even a simple quiz. But when I started using Qualtrics, I could very easily transfer, like we're just transferring from the paper base, transfer all the questions um, relatively quickly. Yeah. And, but that's an interesting, yeah, the automatic marking that that would be, yeah, I mean, they do have that setting um, for sure. Okay. And um, we got people from UST and Hong Kong U here. How did your online assessments go? Anyone want to share from Hong Kong U or UST? Miranda, I can see you there. <laughs> Hi. We transitioned a lot of our, uh, well, almost all of our speaking uh, oral presentations into video presentations. Mm -hmm. Like um, asynchronous ones, yeah. Yeah, we, I don't mm -hmm. think anyone in the center tests listening, so we didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, most of our um, assessments were video pre presentations, either with face, um, which caused some challenges in terms of, you know, students being very unnatural. Um, are they talking to other students? Are they talking to you? Do they have an audience? Or just a narrated PowerPoint presentation? I think we all have the same problems with our sure. recorded video presentations. And we're wondering, well, like, as Jessica says, they do have some advantages, but on the other hand, we're, we're hoping we can go back to face-to-face. -to -face. Yeah, for us, a lot of the advantage is not using class time. Yeah, yeah. Freeing up class time for, uh, for teaching or for feedback or for some kind of learning activity rather than having those, mm -hmm. you know, kind of ra relatively tedious, okay, you get up and present, you get up and present, everyone, you know, the audience kind of falls asleep. Yes, um, but the teacher yeah, have to I stay awake. I had to say about still trying to 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 get some interaction mm -hmm. through a Q and A. It was interesting. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions or comments on assessments? Yeah, I have a quick question actually for Paul. Mm -hmm. um, Hey Paul, just wondered what your what, what your students thought about doing those listening tests online. Did did they think it well, was well? I, I just think it read was the I just read the teacher evaluations uh, yesterday, and some of them, I mean, I guess the the, the they they thought it was a bit difficult for some of them, um, and it wasn't. I mean, I didn't design it to be. I mean, I did design it to be a little bit more difficult because I I, were, I was worried there could be some googling and other assistance, uh, but I didn't, I, I still tried to design it to be manageable. And, uh, but the, uh, uh, the ones, I mean, some of them said, okay, you know, no problem because, you know, they're good at typing or, or whatever, but some of them said it's a lot different typing versus writing. And then uh, may, I think one student said she was depressed while taking the test because it was like, you know, so hard to like focus uh to the the sound or to, to what i was playing on zoom and then try to to transfer the answers to the survey but um i mean i thought it was better than just putting it on moodle and letting the students have a little bit too much freedom uh i think being synchronous online was was, was i could, could could control it better yeah well, thanks yeah Okay. Uh, thank you all. Yeah. So I think now it's time to go to our next session, um, student engagement. Is it Blanche? Yes, Blanche, over to you. Okay. All right. Okay, we are very glad to have uh, three presentations uh, in this section on student engagement. Mm. All right. So um, the first is going to be delivered by Francis. Um, so Francis, okay. <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, Blanche. And, uh, so let me share my screen first. Okay. So are you all viewing my screen? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, so uh, Okay, so my name is Frances. I'm from HUSD. And today I would like to talk about how I integrate multimedia tools in second language acquisition. And I'll be introducing a um, immersion program that I did with the students. Uh, that is called a live streaming section. And actually, to be honest, when I uh, submit the uh, you know, the application to present here. I didn't know which section I should, I should put myself in. So is it about student engagement or is it about, you know, technology? But um, yeah, but I want to talk about the uh, engagement more because with uh, live streaming technology, I'm not an expert. So yeah, I'm just going to be talk about how, how I engage them. Right, so uh, the, the agenda for today. So uh, the name of the immersion program that I'll be talking about is called uh, Travel with Eyelang through live streaming. And uh, to give you a bit of insight for those who do not work in HUSC, Eyelang is actually uh, the informal curriculum uh, for language learning. It's a small team that is, uh, that is based in the CLE in HUST. And yeah, I'll be talking about how uh, we uh, execute that. Uh, and also I'll be talking about the reasons why we want to do uh, that immersion program. And I'll be sort of concluding, um, you know, the, uh, the presentation at the end. And uh, yeah, and if you have any questions, on, um, you can talk about that like after the presentation, like after three presentations. Okay. So about the event, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are doing a live streaming session and it is actually led by the students. And uh, so uh, in this uh, semester, so in the spring semester, we've held three sections and we have invited three different student leaders. So um, the student leaders are of different backgrounds, so they'll be sharing uh, different things as well. And um, the event is actually opened for all HAUSC students. So, uh, you know, everyone uh, who's studying here can register. And the reason why we actually hold it in the spring semester is because spring was supposed to be uh, the peak uh, season for, for students to go on exchange. Um, so we want to act as an alternative uh, for them to have a virtual exchange because uh, most of them can't travel. And uh, yes, yeah, so about the structure. So um, each section is actually one hour and it, we held it on Zoom. And then uh, we uh, designed 45 minutes for live streaming and sharing uh, by the students. And then we have uh, 15 minutes for Q and A. So the last uh, 15 minutes is for them to sort of interact and a bit of a question and answer. So uh, participants are welcome to ask questions in the chat box during the live streaming section. So um, I think it's uh, to make it more interactive. So if they have any questions, they can raise immediately and uh, the, the live streamer will uh, sort of address them uh, um, immediately. And one technical uh, and about the technical issues. So I will address them uh, because uh, when we try to do a pilot section with the student leaders, uh, we actually wanted them to walk around the city that they currently live in because all the student leaders that we have invited are overseas, so they, they're not in Hong Kong. So, uh, but because of the, uh, the internet is not very stable. So uh, at the end, what we did was uh, we, tried to, we tried to ask them to pre-record the scenes uh, on the streets and then they will be showing them uh, afterwards. And, uh, you know, and we also asked them to uh, do, you know, they can share the food, uh, you know, when they present and, and stuff like that. Okay, so. Moving on next. So uh, the reason why we did it was uh, we, wanna, we want the students to uh, keeping pace with globalization. So uh, the three student leaders that we have invited. So the first one is actually from Wuhan and the second one is from Shanghai. And uh, the third one is actually from, uh, from uh, Daegu, uh, South Korea. And we also have different uh, for uh, for the different uh, student leaders. So, um, oops, okay. So, um, 
the first theme that we have is about the food uh, in China and in her hometown, which is Wuhan. And uh, she has shown us like the videos of her eating uh, in, a, in a hot pot restaurant and so on. And, and the students can ask questions about like what they're eating and, 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 and uh, she would show, uh, she would like answer them um, the questions immediately. And the second one is about the uh, post-COVID changes in China. So uh, the student leader is actually uh, is actually from Shenzhen originally, and he's currently living in Shanghai. So he's introducing uh, a lot of like you know changes that uh, he witnessed uh, over the past one and a half years, basically. And the last one that uh, I've talked about. Uh, you know, it, uh, the, the student leader is from uh, Daegu, uh, South Korea. So um, it's actually about the discovery of Daegu, which is um, the city that uh, she lives in. And I'm going to show you uh, two footages that uh, the student leader has shown during the live streaming section. Because of the, in here, there's a lot of good high schools and middle schools, private schools. So a lot of parents wanted to live in, that's why the housing is extremely expensive and living is really costly. Okay, and uh, the other footage is about um, the student, uh, the live streamer going to her favorite arcade. And it's really loud and dark. Yeah, so uh, by this, um, I think uh, the student can have, uh, the participants can have uh, a sense that they are, tra uh, they're traveling uh, as well. In here, there's a lot of good Sorry. high schools and middle uh, schools and it's private schools. So a lot of so yeah, sustaining uh, learner engagement. So uh, we find that actually this is a very important, uh, you know, aspect uh, with online learning because we know that a, la a good language learner is an individual who is actually able to communicate and interact using the language. And I don't know if it's just a pro it's just my problem or is that a problem for everybody here? Is that usually during Zoom classes, uh, we don't have a lot of respond. Uh, you know, we, we don't know what they're doing. We don't know, we ask the questions and we don't know if they're actually, you know, if they're actually uh, listening to us. So, uh, however, uh, you know, when, when I, uh, when we have this uh, live streaming section, we realize that uh, the students were very eager, like as you can see from the from the screenshot. So you know, even like simple questions like where you're from, and uh, they were very eager to answer. And um, mm, sorry to interrupt, Francis, because uh, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Right. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, now let's move over to our second presentation, also from uh, also colleagues from uh, UST. Okay. So over to Thomas and Jason. Okay. Thank you. Let me share my screen first. Thank you. All right. Can everyone see it? 
Okay, great. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jason and I are today are going to talk about Miro and how we use it to form an affinity space and for student engagement as well. So just a short disclaimer, uh, Jason and I are not paid by Miro and this is not a paid sponsorship for this presentation. Okay. Oops. So what exactly is Miro? So Miro is an online collaborative whiteboard that both students and teachers can post and edit on in real time. So this real time element is really important because it sort of uh, mimics the real life interaction patterns you would have in a classroom, but on an online platform. On Miro as well, there's a lot of a variety of design tools built in. For example, you could create sticky notes, create frames, embed uh, hyperlinks, embed videos for students to watch. So there's a lot of uh, choices to choose from. So how did we incorporate Miro into our course? So we integrated as part of the course design. So what that means is that at every stage of the course, we try to use Miro as much as possible. So the end goal for the students at the end uh, of the course is that they had to create a final group project. So for the workshops to help them with that or the lessons, we did it all on Miro. When the groups had to do planning for the group projects, we encouraged them to do it on Miro for the assessments as well, where, where did they have to present it on, all on Miro. So why did we do it this way? It's because we felt that we wanted to give them as many opportunities as possible to explore using the tool. So once, normally when a tool is introduced uh, online or offline, maybe it's used once for one task and then it's probably never used again. So students don't really get the tool, understand it in a, at a deeper level. But by giving them opportunities, they're able to understand the advantages, disadvantages, how can they use it for their own purposes, uh, things like that. What about student engagement though? How can Miro be used for that? So one way you could use Miro is that if you want to create a set of standardized lessons for all teachers to use, you could set up the tasks and instructions beforehand and then just duplicate the Miro board and just give it to all the different teachers. Another way for uh, engagement is uh, on the Miro board, you just talk to the students, ask for real immediate participation and input from the students. For example, you could ask them to uh, share something that you learned from the last lesson or ask them to all contribute to a brainstorm on a certain topic. So this uh, real life engagement also allows for real time monitoring as well. A big problem that a lot of us face on the online classroom is that we have no idea what our students are doing. But on the Miro board, you can actually see the cursors move around so you can see different parts of the board being edited in real time. So sort of like you're watching like a real time traffic update, but uh, in, in a classroom. And the last part is in terms of engagement, they, they can engage with each other outside of the classroom as well. So when they're planning for, uh, planning for the group projects, they don't need to just send each other attachments. Everyone just contributes in real time on this Miro board. So I'd like to just share a few uh, samples of uh, the, the work we did on Miro. So what you can see here is an example of the workshop that we did. You can see on the left, the different design tools that the, uh, both students and teachers can use. On the right, you can see the instructions that uh, I talked about earlier. And in the middle, the uh, students' contributions. Oops. And here's an example of a student's own planning board for their group projects. So you may be wondering, looks quite similar to what uh, they've done in class, and that's completely fine. We want the students to be able to pick and choose the uh, useful things that they learn from these workshops and use it on their own, because it, sh it shows a, a learning process of the technology. Uh, here's uh, just some example of the academic blogs the students produce. You can see that they, they have the common elements you would find in academic uh, blog, so that such as headings, hyperlinks, pictures, structure, titles, etc. And last but not least, is, uh, uh, here's a video that the students produced. Although they can't make the video on Miro, they can embed the video and uh, use it as part of their presentation. All right, I'm going to pass the time now to Jason. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. So I'll try to relate to some recent uh, scholarly works on collaborate, collaboration and digital literacy. We believe uh, Miro can um, be used as an affinity space, um, as in uh, 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 James Podge's um, concept, conceptualization of uh, affinity space online. And so the workshop we have with the students is actually um, for us to provide guidance for them to get used to the platform. Um, but just as what Thomas said, actually, sometimes we don't know what's happening to the students when they are engaged in their group work. It's like a black box to us. So in the in the workshop, 
outside workshop, out of class, they can still keep working on Miro to keep working together right, even after class. So we believe it's, um, Miro can be used as a micro community to uh, support the micro com community. Um, and with the final outcome, uh, the, the academic block, right, we believe uh, just like what uh, Hefner and Miller said, with a defined outcome, it can really help them to stay focused uh, on the task. Okay, so, um, well, I, I believe uh, just like Je what Jessica has um, presented earlier, um, actually the use of um, digital technologies can help us to support not just language development, but also to support students to use various semiotic resources, oh. video, sound, image, to convey their message. So besides conventional uh, literacy or academic literacy skills like forming an academic argument, right? Actually, they can still do, do use it, but just in different modes. So um, we believe uh, there's, a, well, uh, there's a lot to learn as teachers and as students as well. So um, next slide, please, um, Thomas. Yeah, thank you. So I think it's for students, for teachers, I think we have a lot to learn. Like Thomas and I, we spend like two hours uh, maybe I have I spent more huh? learning how to use Miro uh, before the first workshop, but actually we are demonstrating um, uh, well how to use this technology to overcome spatial barriers during COVID. I believe we can use we can also use the same uh, skills we learned after COVID. Um, so there are some takeaways. It, it, well, interestingly, it seems. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, well, similarity between our takeaways and the one Jessica just shared earlier. Like, um, well, it, it's good for group work, right? Uh, as I said, planning or group work, right? Seems to be black box. But now with Miro, it seems, uh, well, this kind of uh, platform, I right, can still support collabor uh, collaboration um, online, well, well, in the lesson and outside the lesson. And um, we believe the, um, the kind of literacy skills, collaborative, collaborative skills right, that they use through this Miro project uh, will be useful for them, uh, not just you know, during this COVID. I believe, um, well, like teachers, right? Um, I, I believe, well, next year onwards, we will be uh, better, well, more skillful in using mixed mode to teach. I believe uh, only 25 seconds left. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas and Jason. We'll now move on to the um, to the last presentation of this section. All right. And uh, and here we have uh, Catherine from the Education University. Catherine, over to you. Thank you, Blanche. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine. I'm from CLE of uh, um, HK, and today I would like to share with you an e-learning package that I designed for blended learning to enhance student engagement. Uh, so basically, uh, firstly, let me tell you why I would uh, design this e-learning package. Uh, this e-learning package actually is part of the big project of our university. Uh, it's called Blue. Uh, blended learning for university enhancement. Um, basically, right now we're near the end of this uh, phase two already. It started in 2017. The aim is actually to develop e-learning packages, mobile applications, VR, AR activities, and mini MOOCs. Um, the main purpose is that we're using a policy which is called one online lesson for on uh, course. That was started before the pandemic. And this actually continues uh, during the pandemic as well. Then what I was involved in was to develop an e-learning package for blended learning sessions. So um, there's no official definition of what an uh, e-learning package should look like. Uh, generally speaking, it said that we want to come up uh, with a suite of online learning resources, uh, including uh, response-based and collaborative activities that are aligned with the course learning outcomes to complement the face-to-face -face teaching and learning or online synchronous teaching sessions. So we hope that we could be able to encourage students to reflect on their learning by attempting some of the activities and using the resources we provided. Then the target course that I implement this uh, uh, is a pre it's a course for in-service kindergarten teachers, um, mainly focusing on developing their academic writing uh, skills and also workplace uh, English. 
So um, the students' backgrounds are very diverse. Uh, some of the students are probably uh, have been working as a kindergarten teacher for many years uh, with uh, comparatively lower skills in technology and also uh, lower skills in English proficiency. So then uh, I implement this package in semester two, that means uh, last semester. So we got some students feedback as well. Then uh, how is this uh, implemented in this course? Uh, we started from synchronous online teaching sessions, and then we are going to take uh, two sessions off. Uh, basically, um, there are uh, one session um, followed by the synchronous teaching sessions. Students are going to do some of the activities uh, for collaborative learning and also independent learning. And then they will go back to the classroom, I mean, Zoom synchronous teaching session again to complete their learning cycle. Then what is included in the, this e-learning package? Uh, this e-learning package uh, includes five video lessons. This is uh, in-house made videos. Uh, then I did a video shooting in our university uh, video shooting lab. Um, with the support from the project. And then these videos have some animation and some questions. So uh, I know that there are a lot of uh, uh, tools, for example, iPods or Neoport, which are widely used by other universities, even inside our universities. Then the reason why I didn't choose it, I used a bit more conventional and traditional way to shoot this video, uh, actually are related to our students' needs. And that's why everything that I develop here, I want to say is that it's embedded in our LMS uh, Moodle. So for students' convenience to access, so the activities would include a Moodle discussion forum, a wiki page, and a Moodle quiz. Um, since the blended learning activities uh, will be conducted during the two weeks, that's to say students are sent off and then they're going to complete these activities and study these videos. We're not very sure whether they're really sleeping during the two weeks or they're actually watching these videos and complete these activities. Then let me share with you some of the evidence. So the first thing I want to share is actually the length of the views of the video lessons that I produced. Uh, it's interesting that the first video we released to our students had more views uh, compared with the others. Uh, this is the second one, and that's also received more attention from our students. Uh, this uh, uh, video package, uh, e-learning e package was uh, exposed to around the number of 130 students. So uh, if you take a look at the first two, I think it's very pleasant and uh, students are really are watching it. Um, these two activities, uh, the activities students are going to do related to two activities actually are stronger and closer. Basically without watching this, they may not be able to how to know what to write and what to respond in the foreign discussion and uh, the wiki page. While the others that received much less uh, attention uh, are more general uh, academic skills, for example, how to integrate academic sources into the writing and APA documentation style. So uh, this is one thing we can see, um, but overall, uh, I think I spend a lot of time in the studio lab, um, but students think like uh, they're really watching. Um, so the second thing is uh, uh, how students really are writing, uh, collaborating with the, con uh, with the peers then. So this is one of the comments of students post uh, on the foreign discussion. This part, we don't really have any uh, requirements on the length of the words. Uh, we didn't really say that you have to comment for how many. But if you take a look at this one, generally speaking, students are using the principles I introduced in the video and also uh, suggesting what should be improved it, what, what should be improved and how to improve. Uh, so overall, majority of students actually uh, are collaborating and also learning from each other by reading each other's posts. So here is the one of the wiki page. Uh, this wiki page requires students to find the academic resources for support and share with each other. They're also required to write a summary of the source. Uh, this is a, a bit challenging and uh, the engagement level, I have to say, is comparatively low. Uh, only three of my students out of uh, 28 students post it over there. And this one does not really count to win any marks. <laughs> so the number of students who participated uh, was um, is, is actually very low. Um, so this part, I think, uh, is one of the things we can reflect when we are going to design these activities. Uh, how can we engage more students' participation? 
So here is the quiz results. Uh, on average, uh, like in my group, I got 28 students. The length of the attempts is uh, 105. So the on average is 7.6 out of 10 marks. So I think uh, students um, basically are trying their quiz for a few times in order to get more marks, in order to get more marks. So uh, this is the overall um, uh, evidence I can share with you. I had a focus group meeting with our students to talk about whether they really like this uh, um, approach. So basically, because they are in-service kindergarten teachers, um, they welcome this approach because of the flexibility and convenience we provide to them. They don't have to go uh, to, um, online to have sessions with us or they have don't have to go back to their physical classroom. Um, they also say that they like the design because it's related to the course assessments and is embedded in the uh, LMS. So uh, they suggest to have a longer videos uh, and also more uh, examples to be given. So my reflection is that I think this e-learning package is a very interesting experiment for me. I learned quite a lot through the video produ production. And uh, I think one thing we can consider once we go back to resume the face-to-face -face teaching, uh, we can consider probably some of the sessions maybe can be replaced by this kind of blended learning resources to give more space to students to reflect on their learning. So uh, thank you very much. This is the end of my sharing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, we now have uh, some time for a discussion. So uh, let's see uh, whether there are questions. Mm. All right, uh, we have one question from uh, Joanna. Uh, any student feedback uh, for Francis and uh, Thomas? Uh, sorry, for Francis. Any student feedback on the live streaming sessions? Um, yes, uh, we, we did uh, a survey. Um, for for all three sections, and uh, they found it really uh, interactive, um, especially for uh, the uh, for the section uh, of the group because uh, I think most of them um, they have a lot of you know they they're very interested in uh, in Korean culture basically, and so uh, they they found it really uh, interesting to have you know. Um, like of someone who's from Korea to kind of like present that. And also in terms of um, language awareness. And um, I think because, uh, because of COVID, they do not have a lot of chances to interact with international students. So uh, they really treasure the opportunity and they really did ask quite a, lot, quite a number of questions and they really enjoyed it. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, there's a question for Catherine in our chat um, about yes. uh, the, the three students. Yeah. Have any, did they give any feedback on, on the task or the platform? Despite okay. Yes. Uh, the first question, uh, thanks very much from uh, Kali. Uh, it's true. Well, one of the main reasons uh, why that wiki page activity does not have many responses from the students, I think one uh, is that it's not counted towards any marks compared with the other activities. Uh, though the number of the marks we give to students for each of the activity is not really a lot, five marks, but five marks to them um, mean something. That's why they, they did more for the other activities. And another reason for Wiki is because I, I think that that's, uh, activity is a bit challenging, looking for sources and summarize um, uh, academic journal and post and share is a challenging activity for this group of students. So partly, I think that's the reasons. Oh, uh, with, okay, yes, please. Uh, yeah, we did give feedback, but uh, um, students were not really motivated in that wiki activity. Uh, the videos, uh, thanks for Joanna. The videos, uh, according to the reviewers uh, of the Blue Project, uh, we are suggested to keep the video length very uh, short. Yeah, it's very uncommon for, for asking for more videos. Uh, the videos that I produced, the longest one is uh, uh, less than six minutes, um, but then students want more examples. Um, the video they're referring to, we're talking about APA end of text references. Uh, they want more examples. We actually provided text uh, references for students, but it seems like they don't prefer having that. The videos I produced, maybe I have, they see my face and also explanation notes uh, through uh, my explanation. Uh, that's more welcomed by our, our students. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, I have a question uh, for Francis. Uh, with the three student leaders, okay, uh, when they produce those um, footages, 
were they working with other people or basically it, it was a solo type of work? Um, it was supposed to be solo, actually. We, we wanted them to do like a selfie kind of, you know, um, um, video. But, uh, but most of them, uh, when, when they're trying to do that, they reflected that is very difficult. Uh, you know, if they have to take videos at the same time, they have to eat something or they have to play, like, you know, go to the arcade and stuff like that. So I think they, they did find a friend to help them at the end. Okay, all right, thank you, thank you. Okay. Any questions for our individual presenters or any suggestions or comments on, on the topic? Given uh, our experience in the, in the last, in the last two years, last year or so, uh, with, um, you know, with online teaching and student engagement, which has always been an issue. Any particular questions that anyone would like to raise here? Hmm? Okay, all right. If not, then uh, Lillian, should we move on? Yes. Peace. We will now have a break. Let's say we take an eight minute break and we'll come back for the last four presentations and uh, hopefully we will have some time for the breakout discussion. All right. So see you in eight minutes. Thank you.